Welcome to the Functional Medicine Foundations podcast, where we explore root cause medicine, engage in conversation with functional and integrative medicine experts, and build community with like-minded health seekers. I'm your host, Amber Warren. Let's dig deeper. Okay. Well, we're back here with our fourth podcast with a live audience. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Um, I'm back here with Dr. Mar- Mark Holhouse. Dr. Hello, Mark Holhouse hello. is the Chief Medical Officer of FMI Center for Optimal Health and Functional Medicine Idaho, specializing in hormone optimization, age reversal, metabolic health, and longevity. With over 32 years of family practice experience, he graduated from Loma Linda University School of Medicine and has completed his family practice training at UC Davis Medical Center through the Air Force Scholarship Program. As an expert in functional and integrative medicine, Dr. Holhouse has been part of the teaching faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, educating practitioners nation- nationwide for the past decade, worldwide, I should say. We know that's worldwide now. Additionally, yeah. he serves as an assistant professor of medicine at Loma Linda School- University School of Medicine, focusing on preventing cardiometabolic diseases and reversing conditions such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. Dr. Harthouse, Holthouse, excuse me. Harthouse is Hart good. House, I like that. that should be your new nickname. Dr. Holthouse <laughs> is available. I've been called a lot of things, Amber. To, that's not one. <laughs> to see patients in Idaho, Oregon, Nevada, and California. Outside of his medical career, him and his wife, Tammy, enjoy various outdoor activities, such as photography, snowshoeing, skiing, sailing, hiking, kayaking, and savoring good food. Thank you so much for coming back, Dr. Food Holthouse. Food is fun. Yeah, yeah you guys are kind of foodies. Thing. Well, your wife is a phenomenal cook. Tammy is had, amazing. Yeah, I've and, had her um, meals before. Yeah, I think I have to exercise just to continue to eat Be able all to her eat good food. What she that, makes—that's the real reason. No, she makes good quality food. She does. She does. She does. She's good helpful. clean ingredients. Tasty, healthy, healthy yes, food. That's what we should aim for. Not so, cardboard. No, on the somewhat of a topic of food today, we want to talk about this new kind of epidemic of fatty liver disease that I don't think is spoken about enough. Right? We talk a lot about. I think we talk a lot about cardiometabolic disease and obesity Mm -hmm. and um, even cancer now is a big hot topic, but not a lot of people are talking about fatty liver. Yes. Fatty liver is um, a big deal. It's now uh, 30% of the U.S. population is Mm -hmm. walking around with replacing functioning liver cells with fat because of our poor nutrition and excess calories, mostly in the form of refined carbs and sweetened drinks tops that list. Um, we uh, know that it's a problem because it's associated with, well, t- like 10, 20% of the time, this fatty liver progresses to hepatitis, an inflammatory version of itself. And of that group, another 15 to 20% of them go on to become cirrhotic liver failure, permanent fibrosis scarring, like we used to see with alcoholics. But alcoholic liver disease is, is not near as common now as nutritionally induced fatty liver, which is what we're talking about. When it gets bad enough, it becomes inflamed. And when it gets really bad, it gets scarred down and your liver gets to be like this little shriveled dysfunctional organ. And um, the liver is pretty resilient. It's a little bit like a starfish uh, where you take off or cut off an arm and it'll grow a new one or a lizard's tail. Your liver has that, stop laughing, Carly, I can see you. Um, it has that regenerative ability and um, it, it will take a lot of insults, but everything has its, its, its time where it's going beyond the point of no return. So there are ways, and what we want to talk about, I think a little bit tonight is what causes it, some of the risk mm-hmm. factors, uh, associated risk, why we should care and what we can do about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it's largely driven by a bad diet. There's some genetic and ethnicity predispositions for sure. Uh, we know that African Americans are at lo- lower risk. We know that Hispanics are at a little higher risk as are um, uh, folks from the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Uh, so there is an ethnicity behind how prevalent it is. Um, but it's associated with all of these diseases we've been talking about on some of these other episodes, mm-hmm. prediabetes, mm-hmm. type two diabetes, mm-hmm. metabolic syndrome, uh, hypertension, mm-hmm. SIBO, mm-hmm. small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and dysbiosis mm-hmm. imbalances of the intestinal microbiome are more prevalent in patients that end up having fatty liver disease. What's that mechanism? We think the mechanism is that when you've got a disrupted uh, microflora in your gut, you have what's called increased uh, permeability of the lining of the intestinal tract, or the lay term is leaky gut. 
And all of this goes through the portal vein into the liver, and it promotes an inflammatory condition uh, via the Kupfer cells, which are kind of your little macrophages, if you will, in the liver, not unlike the microglial cells in the brain that act as these inflammatory cells. And this gut inflammation, we call it metabolic endotoxemia. You have things that normally don't come into the blood vessels that drain our food and nutrients from our small intestinal tract leaking through. What's on the other side for them? Lo and behold, 80% of our immune system mm -hmm. hangs out around the gut. And it gets all Twitter-pated about this, what's going on, and we lose what's called oral tolerance. Things that normally don't bother us cause antibodies, cause systemic inflammation. But it, it goes via the portal vein, which is where all of our intestinal blood vessels are, are draining to through the liver before it gets circulated to the rest of the system. So it's, it's a direct shot to the liver. And when you've got an insult to the lining of the intestinal tract, whether it be a leaky gut or this SIBO, small intestinal overgrowth of excess bacteria, um, you can have inflammation and fatty liver develop. So it's not just eating too many carbs, too much sugar, which goes into the liver and becomes fat when you get so much extra glucose in your muscles that your, your liver doesn't know what to do with it. It starts converting it to fat. This is how they make, what's it, foie gras, the stuff, the geese, the gourmet, gross, oh, fatty yes. liver that people actually eat. eat. They, they literally stick a funnel down a goose's throat and they feed it dextrose, sugar. No. And this is how they make the liver and the goose fatty. And this is to how they produce yummy. this stuff. Oh so when you do that, you know, imagine a, taking a human and pouring a sugary drink or uh, a lot of tortillas or chips mm -hmm. frequently mm -hmm. in the diet. Uh, eventually, uh, our bodies are nutritionally starving and calorically over nourished and there's nowhere for this excess nutrient mm -hmm. glucose to go so this the the, the skeletal muscles used it all mm -hmm. it starts spilling over into the subcutaneous safe fat reservoir for energy but then after that it has really nowhere else to go except the liver mm -hmm. and and the other organs and we mm -hmm. call that visceral fat mm -hmm. fatty pancreas fatty liver mm -hmm. our organs are filling up with fat because of the food we're eating guys and the lack of exercise. Exercise where you really get your skeletal mus muscles burning a lot of that energy can take us a long ways towards preventing that. Mm. But at the end of the day, if we're getting too much gut inflammation, if we've got dysbiosis, if we're just taking in too many refined carbs, we get this fatty liver. Do toxins impact the liver in that same way? That you the, do. the blood sugar disposal does. Yeah, it's yes. the same mechanism, right? Yes, okay. same, same, often same mechanism. So a lot of our folks were looking at things like chemicals in their urine yeah. to see if this is problematic. The, the problem is that it, it takes our liver, which has this vital function of detox, mm -hmm. and it's out of commission. Yeah, so which is we're, very concerning in today's day and age to right? be, have an out of commission liver. <laughs> out of commission liver is not good. Yeah. That's how we're metabolizing all of our toxins. Right from inside, from our mm -hmm. process of metabolism and all the stuff we take in from the outside right. is now stuck in us when we've yeah. got a liver that's 50, 60% fat, that's you know 40% functioning now. Right. It's, right. it's like a V8 engine that's on four cylinders. I came across an article um, last week where they were talking about, I don't remember, some scientists saying that the uh, this whole... Um, arena of talking about detoxification and detox protocols and why we need to detox is totally bogus because we all have functioning livers. And I was thinking about like what you just said, like, mm. no, we actually don't all have functioning livers. So yeah. we do need to detox. We actually, do need to worry about clearing out the liver on a consistent basis. The national data is now government studies showing that a third of us don't actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's not even taking into account alcohol abuse, right? you know, which is going to add to this. Yeah. Um, so if, if a third of us are walking around with dysfunctional livers, 47% of the United States population is either type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic, um, you start adding these things up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's amazing that the body does it as well as it does with all this abuse. Yeah. But this is what we see in our offices, right, mm -hmm. all day long, mm -hmm. are elevated liver enzymes. Yeah. I've been doing this long enough to remember just not too long ago, 10, 15 years ago, 
I did not see that unless there was hepatitis, right. viral hepatitis right. or, right. you know, closet drinking. Well, and it's concerning because it's not just elevated liver enzymes outside the normal range, right? Mm-hmm. We're looking to have actually optimal, optimal liver enzymes. And then right. there's this other biomarker we look at in the blood called a GGT, mm-hmm. and that can actually climb before our two liver enzymes we look at on a metabolic panel. So yeah. um, you sometimes have to dig a little deeper and ask more questions yeah. um, on yeah. that metabolic panel and ask for more, more blood tests to really look at how healthy your liver is or how yeah. healthy it isn't. So that's actually a question that just came in from our live audience. How do we diagnose fatty liver? So fatty liver is usually seen um, by lab tests and then we confirm it with an ultrasound. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll look at liver tests very commonly. The GGT is a little bit more sensitive. We stopped doing that 20 years ago on the chem panels because it was always coming back positive and I was told not to order it because we didn't know what to do with it. That's now a, we do. We know what to do That's a good reason now. not to order yeah, a test, right. by the way. Right. Um, so the GGTs are, are something we actually value highly because they're, they're a, a more sensitive indicator for liver cell damage, mm-hmm. whether it's alcohol use, whether it's a statin use, whether it's uh, too much fat come to find out. By the time the ALT and the AST liver enzymes are elevated, predominantly that ALT in this, fa- this case, um, things are well underway as far as fatty liver replacement. And so you confirm these abnormal labs by having them do an ultrasound of your liver. And it's, it's, it's there. Now, the ultrasounds don't always show it when it's there. It's, it's not always apparent. It's a spectrum. Uh, but the liver tends to enlarge before it scars down and gets cirrhotic. So we've got this, this inflammatory phase that it follows the fatty replacement, which we call NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH. And that's hepatitis because you've got markers showing it's inflamed. That's the liver test we're talking about. After that, there's a, a good number of those folks that sometimes can go on Now, the first two stages, there's three stages of this thing. Um, The first two stages are reversible. Mm -hmm. Non-alcoholic liver disease, and now we call it metabolic dysfunction liver disease. There's a new name floating around. And NASH can be reversed. Pretty quickly, Pretty quickly. This is not a long, yeah. You know, what is it? Five to 7% body weight loss will Mm -hmm. reverse uh, NLD, the first phase. It takes about eight to 10 pounds uh, of body weight loss to reverse NASH, mm-hmm. the hepatitis. Once you get to the fibrosis where it's starting to scar down and, and shrink and, and literally you think of a scar, how it shrinks as it heals, um, that, that's past the point of no return. So minimal weight loss, mm-hmm. and, and it just so happens when you talk about what, what do we do about it, mm-hmm ends up being incredibly helpful yeah, absolutely. to reverse this. Yeah, amazing. So um, where do we start with our patients if there's concerns? Where do you start? What are your recommendations for treatment? Yeah, if, uh, the, so who, who's, who's at risk? You know, mm-hmm. uh, in our patients, it's our diabetics. Mm-hmm. You know, it's our pre-diabetics. It's our obese patients. Mm-hmm. Um, it's our hypertensive patients. 50 to 90% of people with high blood pressure have fatty liver. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. 80 to 90% of our obese patients, that's a BMI over 30, have fatty liver. So high blood pressure patients, people with pre or or full on type two diabetes, uh, people with rapid weight loss, people on terzepatide, GLP-1s, are at risk for fatty liver. This is why when you have rapid weight loss, sometimes you'll see problems with the liver like this or gallstones occur. People ending up having to get their gallstone out with fatty liver um, being uh, behind that with rapid weight loss. People with high levels of uric acid uh, are at risk for fatty liver. Mm -hmm. Why? Uric acid's a metabolic downstream marker of fructose metabolism. So if you're getting a lot of fructose, fruit sugar in your diet, The only place that metabolizes fructose is your liver, unlike glucose that gets metabolized all over the place, including skeletal muscle. The liver's got an exclusive, unfortunately, and that's why it gets hit really hard with too much fructose. This is why we don't have people doing agave syrup and things like this, or or, um, a lot of cane sugars and and things like that, uh, because of the high fructose. Um, And it's not just the high fructose stuff, it's just fructose in general 
that's metabolized very differently. Um, you guys remember probably that table sugar sucrose is made up of a molecule of glucose and fructose. Glucose is metabolized much more easily than the, than the latter. So uric acid, people with high uric acids at risk for fatty liver. What are the dose? What are the, the ranges? Ideally, we want to see, and this is a hard one, Amber, we want to see females with a uric acid south of four. Oof. That's yeah. low. That is low. That's a minority of my patients, yeah. I'll tell you. It tells yeah. you about, well, 93% of the U.S. population has what we call um, metabolic dysfunction, mm -hmm. an inability to use fats and ketones and free fats over just glucose. Yeah. And um, so this is, a, and there's lots of reasons for this besides just obesity and eating too many carbs. It has to do with things like toxicity, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, whatnot. But um, my goodness, um, and for guys, it's five or less for uric acid. Mm -hmm. I can count on one hand in the last few months how many guys, and I check this on all my patients, I've seen yeah. less than five. Agreed. You know, it's not just a marker for gout. Yeah. It's a marker of insulin resistance, but more importantly, it's a marker for excess fructose. Mm -hmm. So it's a key when you see that to intervene with diet and, and solicit a dietary um, history and work with your nutritionist to find out. And that's what our, our, our D Haley here is so good at looking at. Yeah. She's using these CGM machines mm -hmm. um, along with the chronometer macro counter to get an idea. These two things interface, um, not just on getting adequate amino acids, but looking at mm -hmm. um, some of these things with carbohydrate. Uh, other patients at high risk, um, are really your patients that have abnormal lipids, high triglycerides, dyslipidemias, cholesterol issues, mm -hmm. um, for sure, sure, to really help move the needle. Mm -hmm. I think it's exciting. It's an yeah. exciting time to be in Absolutely. metabolic medicine. For sure. I, I couldn't agree more. I've come to really love it. Uh are you tired of cookie cutter health that doesn't address your unique needs? It's time to discover functional medicine care designed to help you flourish. At FMI, you'll gain access to a range of benefits tailored to support optimal health and longevity. Experience the power of personalized care and take control of your health with an annual membership at FMI Center for Optimal Health. Visit www.fmioptimal.com slash membership today and start thriving. Um, exercise. What are the specific exercise recommendations? Because I think we, it's hard to be specific with nutrition because yeah, we have to evaluate labs and look at the person in front of us. Mm. But I think it, it's a little bit easier for us to make more concrete exercise recommendations with these metabolic patients. It is. So what are you recommending? Yeah. Exercise data is, is better than nutritional data. Yes. I mean, yes. nutritional studies are, are so fraught with um, interference. Yeah. It's so hard to tease out. And, and a lot of these dietary studies are, are self-reported mm -hmm. dietary diaries that people, mm -hmm. who knows if they're accurate or not. Yeah. Or who funded and, them? What big food corporation funded the nutrition studies, right? Exactly. That's difficult. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know that we'll ever have good nutritional data. Mm -hmm. So seed oils are a really big deal in fatty liver, right? That's what I hear. Yeah. I don't know a lot about that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can enlighten me. Yeah. From what I understand, <clears throat> I mean, that's that's a lot of the metabolic dysfunction, but directly related to fatty liver, right? These safflower, sunflower, um, peanut oil, um, canola. Oh, canola. I don't even think we can call it a real oil. Um, but yeah, the body doesn't Grape know how to seed. recognize these oils. Grapeseed. Yeah. So um, getting my patients um, to not be fearful of good quality grass-fed organic butter. Um, maybe cooking with that instead of these fake refined inflammatory oils, um, using organic high quality, being careful with the olive oil that you purchase. Um, even coconut oil has a time and a place in, in moderation. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, someone sent me something recently, uh, actually a local dietitian I know on the dangers of avocado oil. And I'm like, oh no. So I need to look into that because I use a lot of avocado, avocado oil in my home. That's, um, but yeah, just it, just it being a more uh, processed oil. Um, but yes, more anti-inflammatory oils, which makes it really difficult to eat out. <laughs> mm -hmm. MUFA, monounsaturated yes. fatty mm -hmm. acids have been like our only safe fat, or know. not only safe fat, oh, obviously polyunsaturated fatty acids are yeah. great too. And we, we're all short of marine-based EPA, DHA, omega-3s. Right. Um, but my goodness, I mean, if you, you listen to the, a lot of the folks I really respect, Peter Atia, mm -hmm. you know, on fats and 
olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and 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 um, and safflower oil are some of the uh, have the highest content of, of pure mufa. Yep. Uh, that are out there that are that are safe, and yes, some of these other seed oils you try to minimize mm-hmm. as much as possible. You think about it: the, the more highly processed these things are, um, the more harmful they they can be. And how they were processed, mm-hmm. what kind of heat treatment right. was it? A, you know, cold expeller press. And it's so important how they they were prepared. We know that these. Um, and we won't even talk about C15. We'll save that for another. Who's going to bring another, that up? Okay, are you going to bring okay. that up? I was gonna, well, it's maybe. probably too soon. <laughs> uh, C15 is the new odd chain uh, saturated fat acid that's taken the whole fatty discussion mm-hmm. by storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there is some data. It's very, very limited uh, showing superiority in anti-inflammation and some of the areas that we've always you know, done the genuflect for with uh, omega-3 fatty acids, right. EPA and DHEA. Right. I'm not to the point yet where I'm replacing those things, but I'm you certainly yeah. I'm certainly considering it as an add-on, uh, the well, C15 I was oils. actually going to ask if you are aware of the C15 on data on fatty liver. I'm I not. Assume it's uh, there. Other than what I heard at a, at a single lecture in Las Vegas uh, recently, I, I'm not. Okay. And, and the claim there was that it has some benefit. Okay. Um, I assumed, yeah. Yeah, so a little early. Okay, I'm an early adopter, but yeah. I'm not that early. Yeah. I want to see more data. Mm-hmm. We've really got just the one company that's out there promoting mm-hmm. their product, mm-hmm. and um, it's not inexpensive. And no, what's it's not. which is what is interesting is that uh, C15 is less expensive mm-hmm. in you know, raw resource than omega threes. Right. So I, I'm, I'm yeah, I've got more I need to vet on that okay. before I'm. Time will tell. Yeah. So for now, you know, focus on getting more omega threes. We're all, for the most part, high in omega sixes in this culture, which are, can be pro-inflammatory. They're still very, very important. But if you look at the the ratios, uh, whether it's in a red blood cell index or in the in the blood, uh, whole blood, we're we're usually quite low on EPA and DHA, which are really almost exclusively gotten from fish. Mm-hmm. And algae sources. I love that. That there's another test that I don't think is ran enough or acknowledged enough. An omega check. Mm-hmm. Um, so valuable for us to see total omega threes in the human body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and again, we're you know I think normal range they're saying is above maybe five percent. Yeah. Our higher risk patients, yeah, eight, seven eight percent, eight, 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 eight yeah. even more optimal. Yeah. You know, and it takes a while for that to change. You're you're looking at incorporating fats into the red blood cell uh, phospholipid membrane, mm-hmm. which can take two to three months, mm-hmm. as opposed to just a serum level of omega threes, which can change within a couple weeks. Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a great in the in the context of plasmologens and phosphatidylcholine and some of these other hot topics on lecithin and and mm-hmm. and. and uh, uh, lipid medicine uh, that are out there. So yeah, so we have inflammatory oils. We've got some of the white white sugars we should be avoiding. White foods in general, excess carbohydrates. What other foods mm-hmm. are you saying mm-hmm. we're worried about fatty liver? Yeah, get them out. Gatorade. <laughs> there you go. I said it. Uh, <laughs> juices in general. You know, yeah. without the fiber, I'm yeah. not a fan of juicing. Yeah, because you're you're um, you're eliminating the fiber, which. Mm-hmm. We talked about in the last episode mm-hmm. all the wonderful things it does for short chain fatty acid and and G, uh, GLP and NO and and those things, but uh, it slows the rate of absorption of that glucose spike and consequent insulin spike. Mm-hmm. And what we're trying to do with these CGMs on our arms, and I'm seeing more and more people in the supermarket walking around with them. I it's love awesome. it. It's awesome. It's awesome. We're teaching people what foods to avoid. Yeah. Not just because it spikes their sugar and sends their alarm off, but right. because those are correlated with spikes in insulin. Right. And we know that every time that happens, that's taken time off their life. Right. It's associated with a, a right. decrease in longevity. Yeah. So, um, well, and it's behavior modification as well, mm-hmm. um, because it's also interesting to see what your blood sugar will do after a toxic conversation or yeah. after a poor night's sleep or yeah. after not enough exercise or too heavy or too intensive exercise. So I think it also is just creates more body awareness and mm-hmm. um, yeah, allows well, you, you to- talk about fats. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that more because mm-hmm. this is Nash. This mm-hmm. is fatty liver. Does eating fat cause fatty liver? Yes and no. Yeah. Not in the way you might think. Mm-hmm. Um, eating refined grains, refined carbs, mm-hmm. juices, yeah. you know, fructose, that's how you get a fatty liver like, like that. that. Mm-hmm. 
Um, if you eat a lot of saturated fats, there's data that shows if you're obese and or you eat a lot of saturated fats, mm -hmm. certainly trans fats, right. you open up this gut, this leaky mm -hmm. gut thing. You increase your gut permeability. You get this metabolic endotoxemia, which just means that you've got inflammation in your system mm -hmm. because you've let things in across your gut wall that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And the immune system sees that and goes kind of nuts. Mm -hmm and it overreacts mm -hmm. and you get, voila, a systemic inflammatory uh, scenario. So indirectly, if you're one that when you eat saturated fats, a lot of dairy, a lot of red meats, you're getting leaky gut from that, you could create inflammation in your liver secondary to that. It's creating a dysbiosis. We know that studies are pretty clear. If you eat a ton of fat in your diet, it changes your microbiome. Mm -hmm. And that dysbiosis, that imbalance, can lead to fatty liver. That's been proven. Um, fatty liver is dangerous. It's not only associated with hypertension. Diabetics in studies that have fatty liver versus diabetics, type 2 diabetics that do not, have much higher rates of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Fatty liver by itself predicts heart disease, mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's why we care. Mm -hmm. Four horsemen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. top causes of, of what's killing us mm -hmm. in this country, chronic diseases. So it's really just another symptom. So avoiding carbs, possibly avoiding excess saturated fats. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? Test, don't guess. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. You know, look know. at their genetics. Look right. at their APOE. If they've got a four mutation, there's a good chance that, that saturated fats may be not only increasing their, their um, atherogenic LDL, and ApoB. So if you see a high ApoB on someone who's doing carnivore, you gotta, you gotta worry that that's not all good. Right. Um, I'm not as concerned about LDL-C yeah. as I yeah. am ApoB or LDL particle number. Particle. If you see those going up, you can't just ignore that and say LDL doesn't matter. Right. That, that's not at Off all the what the studies show. And I see that all over the internet. I know. It's just not true. Um, the... Um, do you see yes. a correlation with fatty liver and low HDL or good happy cholesterol? You know, um, the, yes, absolutely. The pattern and the cholesterol that you'll see most every time uh, with fatty liver is high triglycerides and low yeah. HDL. Yeah. Yeah. It's that pre-diabetic pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And the LDL doesn't seem to matter as much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is what we see in our diabetics, right? right. Many of them have normal LDL, but their trigs are high and their HDL is low. Right. Um, so that is the pattern you often will see with, with fatty liver. I'm just thinking, yeah, if we start cleaning up the liver, because there's there are patients, genetically speaking, that just have low HDL and that HDL can be very cardiac protective. Mm -hmm. So I'm just in my mind thinking, if we offload the liver, mm -hmm. even if it's a pre-fatty liver condition, can we start to see those HDLs climb? And therefore, protective yeah, of the patient. Yeah, that's the holy grail, yeah, raising HDL. Right, we right. haven't been able to figure out a way to do that know, outside hard. of estrogen. Estrogen yeah. is one of the only things associated with maintaining mm -hmm. HDL. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, one of the medications associated with creating fatty liver is estrogen. So when we take what? estrogen orally, yeah. oh, which right, some right. people promote, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, taking estrogen orally, not only does it raise C-reactive protein, our, mm -hmm. our systemic inflammation, it fouls up our triglycerides, but it's now known to be associated with creating fatty liver. Mm. Um, there's several drugs that can do that. That's just one of them. Uh, methotrexate is one, mm. uh, which is used in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and uh, there's several other medications that, that are actually now known to create mm -hmm. fatty liver. Fatty liver. Some of the things that can reverse it, mm -hmm. pharmaceutically, that are being looked at pretty seriously are uh, pyoglitazone, actos, mm -hmm. um, and metformin, okay. yeah, and so. rosiglitazone as well. Mm -hmm. So some of these TCDs, these insulin sensitizing drugs that are used in diabetes medicine um, that raise something called PPAR gamma, mm -hmm. which is inst instrumental in fatty acid metabolism, stands to reason can help prevent fatty accumulation in the liver. Anything that boosts burning fats, we call it beta oxidation in the mitochondria, the utilization of fat for energy decreases the fat in that tissue. And in particular in the liver, 
uh, this is why intermittent fasting has been so helpful mm -hmm. is that anything you can do to keep the insulin low, that's really the only time that you burn mm -hmm. fat. Yeah. So when you're constantly in a post-fed state and right. insulin's always bumping, right. you can't mobilize your stored fat right. from your liver or anywhere else, bring it in and burn it. Well, and there's those also, also the relationship of, you know, talking metabolic endotoxemia, leaky gut, intermittent fasting, giving the digestive system a break, gut healing. So there's that link too, that the intermittent fasting can help heal the gut. Um, yeah, and allow absolutely. you to eat maybe more a little more saturated fat and handle it and not become so inflamed. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably a couple of different links there where that's therapeutic used in the right person. Mm -hmm. um, I it's, just it's the whole reason we intermittent fast. Right. We we red light therapy. Right. We do cold water plunges. Yeah. You and the cow trough. <laughs> um, the um, uh, what else are we doing? We're eating polyphenols, plants with mm -hmm. brightly we're colors. Exercising. Uh, we're, we're doing hit mm -hmm. high intensity interval training. All these things uncouple the mitochondria, right. upregulate longevity, sirtuins, AMP kinase. If I keep saying these weird words that you don't know what they mean over and over, you're going to at least remember to write them down. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to go look them up on Google tonight. Yeah. And then you're going to, oh, okay. That's what that meant. Yeah. Which or send, send it in as a question. And I'll clarify yeah. it. But so, so, I know I'm throwing these things Well, you out. have to stop talking because we've got two great questions that I'm so excited about. <laughs> okay. um, I love this one. I've been reading about new evidence about the benefits of full-fat dairy. What are your thoughts? Mm. Wow, you are making me a lightning rod tonight. <laughs> um, so full-fat dairy has gone, I, I, I understand points on both sides of the argument. Yeah, I'm not a fan personally, full transparency. Okay. I have to tell you honestly what I do. Yeah, I'm not a fan of it because I'm a hormone specialist and I know that the hormones from mammals that are pro-growth reside in the fat. Right. Along with all the toxins. Right. So why would I ingest pro-growth, pro-cancer hormones, even in organic sources of this stuff? And particularly the part that's loaded with all the toxins into my own body. Yeah. Full stop, mic drop, I can't get beyond that. Okay. I understand some of the benefits of full fat dairy from a nutritional perspective. From, uh, from, you know, whether it's the choline and, and, and brain health and yeah. membrane health mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the, the, the wonderful quality proteins mm -hmm. and fats, mm -hmm. get it, not lost on me. But knowing what I do about endocrine disruption, knowing what I do about cancer, breast and prostate in particular, with that topic, I can't get over it. Even can't raw dairy, do you think that maybe there's- Oh, a I, think, I think you're better off there as yeah. far as- um, The microbiome benefits. The microbiome, yeah. the lack of, you know, the, the treatments that are destroying mm -hmm. some of the naturally occurring enzymes mm -hmm. that are going to help people tolerate it. But even then, you know, I, I, I still think you're not getting away from the two issues I brought so, up. So um, are you supplementing calcium or just eating a lot of leafy greens and citrus fruits with calcium? Are you concerned about that or for your wife? So come to find out, milk drinking is associated with more bone loss. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> and yet all my colleagues in, mm -hmm. in, in primary care are saying, load up on the dairy to prevent yeah. osteoporosis, which is one of the worst things you can do. Those are, those are foods that are high in phosphorus, mag, and calcium, but they're not bioavailable. Mm -hmm. And they're pro-inflammatory, which drives bone loss even further down. So green leafies, salmon, there's so many non-dairy, you know, dried figs. There's so many things that you can do outside of dairy to get calcium. Calcium, in my mind, with bone loss, since we're going there, how do we get there from Nash? Um, I know, the, I know, sorry. Is, is um, you know, is one of the least important things to supplement. I think vitamin D3 mm -hmm. uh, at 5,000 units a day, coupled with at least 180 micrograms of MK7, vitamin K2, mm -hmm. is, is where we want to be. Uh, we know that that's going to help not just put the calcium that we absorb from our food, uh, from taking that vitamin D into our bone, it prevents making bone in our arteries. Mm -hmm. So along with pomegranate extracts, uh, I'm really keen on vitamin K2 to prevent placking in the artery. Mm -hmm. It's part of my cardiometabolic deal. Right. So my osteo product and my, my recommendations there are calcium hydroxyapatite. Yep. I like the bone builder product yep, with too. boron. Yeah. And I don't do too much. Mm -hmm. I, I like to get most of the calcium from whole food. Yep. And yes, plants predominantly. Um, 
magnesium. I was going to say checking good, magnesium levels. Wh- whether yeah. it's magnesium malate, magnesium glycinate, bisglycinate, take your pick. Um, those are all really bioavailable, along with D3, K2, and weight-bearing exercise. And, Movement. Yeah, yeah. And, and to bring it back, treat the insulin resistance, yep. right? Because we know that diabetics are at higher risk for osteoporosis. Insulin can drive inflammation, also can drive bone loss. And these are not things you're ever going to hear from your OBGYN. Right. Um, I didn't know this stuff. I had to go back to school to learn how those things affect bone. Right. It's not just about smoking, alcohol, when you started having periods, your mom's history. Right. You know, it's, it's so much right. for, for, farther down the line. Uh, but I think as far as, you know, with a fatty liver, some of the things we can do to treat it, um, I'm always looking at natural stuff, right? Because yeah. we're supposed to be integrative, yeah. right? And yeah. um, we want to avoid synthetic and, and, and the harms of pharmaceutical medicine. Uh, some of the stuff that's got data, because I like to be evidence-based. Uh, people deserve that. They come, they pay us money. We need to have a better um, have a better option. Uh, wow, uh, you know there there are just some things that are new. Uh, again, re, retreading old things for me. Bergamot mm-hmm. cool. tops tops my list. Cool. Uh, bergamot is a, a, a full of polyphenolics. It's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It's an insulin sensitizer, along with berberine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, another botanical mm-hmm. insulin sensitizer it helps with lowering cholesterol as well. Um, uh, we've got globe artichoke, new one for me. Cool. You know, we used to use Jerusalem artichoke mm-hmm. as a prebiotic, right? Okay, Inulin, yeah. FOS, and. Uh, but globe artichoke, amazing insulin sensitization, um, can can help with um, preventing lipogenesis, the production of excess fat in the liver. Mm-hmm. So bergamot, uh, globe artichoke. Um, some of my new favorites are aged black garlic. Love it. Uh, there's great studies on this stuff now that it's anti-neoplastic. Uh, it's, an- it's cardioprotective. It's, it's neuroprotective. Um, it helps prevent building up excess fat, lipogenesis. So it mm-hmm. promotes lipolysis, the, the metabolism, beta oxidation, right? Everyone say it after me in the mitochondria, <laughs> beta oxidation of the fat. That's how you burn your fat. Um, aged black garlic does this. Uh, it improves and helps to prevent fatty liver. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the things on weight loss, which is the number one treatment mm-hmm. for this problem, by the way, mm-hmm. um, other than a lot of the basic lifestyles we talk about with just eating a good whole organic uh, whole foods diet, are some of these botanicals are pretty amazing. Hibiscus mm-hmm. tops the list there. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that's going to naturally help to raise... Um, some of these GLP-1s that I'm talking about in your own intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. Hibiscus, whoever knew. Mm -hmm. Um, Lemon verbena. Oh, cool. And there's great studies, controlled randomized trials, combining hibiscus and lemon verbena on its effect on lowering blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Not insignificantly, but mostly systolic. Um, Weight loss promoting. Mm -hmm. It's... It's it's a great regimen coming off of your shot, yeah. your your yep. your yep. terzepatide, to get people on these things. We have a couple of products back mm-hmm. here that are full of phenolics, products, yeah. acids uh, that we've been talking a lot about from plants tonight. But hibiscus, lemon verbena, uh, really top the list. And then the third real action packed one is um, uh, green coffee bean, mm-hmm. um, which. Usually, this, most studies about 400 milligrams a day. It's been studied mm-hmm. uh, to help with um, blood sugar, help with preventing these fatty liver uh, issues, as well as promoting weight loss. Uh, none of these things are magic bullets. Um, when you take them together with the lifestyle, I think it sets people up for long-term weight loss success, and that's what they're coming in for yep, they when are. they have failed right. and they've gained it back, and they right. say, "You're supposed to know stuff. What do I do?" Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we have to put them back on the, the mm-hmm. pharmaceutical, but then we have them focus on the aminos, right. getting adequate protein, right. focus on the right type of strength training, mm-hmm. maintain that lean muscle, the currency of youth, mm-hmm. right? We get them on some of these botanicals. We change their diet. Yeah. We avoid those, go here. Um, movement, 
super mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Insulin sensitizing, so it really helps to treat fatty liver. Yes. Um, exercise in general. And then there's some pharmaceuticals that are being developed that I mentioned mm-hmm. that are not yet FDA approved for that, but will probably be lo- used off label, metformin being one of them, uh, pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, some of the others that are, that are being talked about. Uh, metformin's got some pretty amazing things. Yes, it has some side effects, and, and there's certain folks that shouldn't use it. Right. Uh, but it's, ama- it's an amazing anti-aging mm-hmm. um, hack mm-hmm. out there. And now we're finding it does some amazing things for uh, promoting weight loss and, re- and helping with fatty liver. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition to its original FDA attended use was a diabetic drug for right. type 2 diabetics. Right. Um, it helps with weight loss. And, and that's affordable. probably why. It's cheap, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, it's inexpensive. Yeah. It's it's French lilac, you know, mm-hmm. from the 1960s and yeah. was re re uh, looked at in the 90s. And and um, this biguanide was made into a, a medication. And um, yes, it's got some side effects, but it's got some amazing things. So mm-hmm. don't count our don't count out pharmaceuticals. We don't want to jump to them first step, but it can in in the right person use the right way with the right combination of things, it can be very helpful, Mm -hmm. even if it's used transiently Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. minimal safety concerns. Yeah. Number one risk of that stuff is diarrhea. And so it can be a game over if Mm -hmm. you have problems with that. But Mm -hmm. um, just um, looking at kind of what people can do. Yeah. You know, diet, exercise, some of those plants I mentioned, um, managing your stress Mm -hmm. uh, and staying away from that doggone refined Carbohydrates, that's the number one thing you can trouble. do. Trouble, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's why, uh, you know, it's, it's such a high number. I didn't know that. It's I learned that last week. Yeah. I was doing a podcast um, with a gal on the East Coast, and we were sharing before the show a paper she just read, Marcel Pick, and she, she blew my mind and said, did you know it's up to a third of the U.S. population now? That's wild. Um, so it's, it's surpassed alcoholism. Mm-hmm. It's surpassed hepatitis C. Mm-hmm. You know, just a few years ago, Hep C was the number one yeah. cause of chronic liver disease. Now it's this thing, this because of lifestyle, lifestyle yeah. induced. We're eating too many. We're carbs, doing it to ourselves. Doing it to ourselves. Yeah. yeah, and it's totally fixable. Yep. Great awareness. That's a good. That's a really good stopping point. Thank you so much, Doctor Holehouse, for Honored. your wisdom and knowledge and your time with us. Thank this you evening. all. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for listening to the Functional Medicine Foundations podcast. For more information on topics covered today, specialties available at the FMI Center for Optimal Health and the highest quality of supplements and more, go to funmedfoundations.com.